In previous videos, we've dedicated a ton of time talking about the analog pocket. And for good reason. With its nostalgic design, quality build, and rare ability to read physical cartridges almost identically to original hardware, it's pretty much the best retro handheld available. Even more so, given the ever-evolving open FPGA support. So here's a question for y'all. How much does the analog pocket hold up when it's no longer handheld? Our analog pocket dock arrived not too long ago, and I've been asking myself that question ever since. The pocket's an easy recommendation for a quick handheld to toss in a bag, but how would a less portable version stand up to other competitors for space on my desk? As expected from analog, this is actually a very good looking dock. The base of the dock is constructed out of a premium feeling hard plastic, while the built-in backrest is constructed of a hefty metallic cylinder. It gives the full look of the dock something akin to a rotated version of Analog's logo. It also provides quite a bit of weight. Combined with the natural heft of the pocket and the padded bottom of the dock, there's some confidence that this won't slide around without me wanting it to. Around back, there are about the right number of ports that the dock should have. Two USB-A ports, one HDMI port, and one USB-C port for charging. Two USB-A ports should be more than enough to connect up to two wired controllers, even if USB hubs aren't supported. But the dock itself supports pairing with up to two Bluetooth controllers at once and native support for Apidu's 2.4G controllers. I really dig that considering I'd rather not be tethered to the dock whenever I want to play games. And I'd much rather use my Apidu SNES controller than an Xbox controller to play old school Nintendo games. In practice, Bluetooth pairing was surprisingly painless by holding down the pairing button on the dock, both with my N30 Pro controller directly and through my Apit Do USB wireless adapter. Home buttons on both controllers also easily access the general game settings menu. Unfortunately, connecting my SN30 2.4G controller was a bit more finicky. After about half an hour trying to pair the controller with the dock, it just wouldn't pair. With a bit more research, it turned out a firmware update was necessary to make the connectivity work. Specifically, I needed to grab a dock-specific firmware file from Apidu's website, connect the controller as a USB storage device to a laptop, and drop the file onto the controller. After doing so, pairing worked just as well as the Bluetooth controllers, but Apidu also states that I probably need to flash a different firmware update before doing anything other than playing on the dock. And, you know, that's all kind of too much work for me, honestly. If you plan to get the dock and use some of your current 2.4G controllers, I might recommend just picking up a Bluetooth controller instead to save yourself the effort, or dedicating a controller specifically to the dock. Once connected though, everything felt fine in general. No noticeable delays, with me sitting at the same table as the dock. Menu options also feel fine to navigate with a controller. It's basically the same menu options as when played handheld, albeit a bit more pixelated. Gameplay feels as good as always though. Playing through a few cartridges, open FPGA cores, and GB Studio games, it's mostly the same experience that I've had while using it handheld. Games look great and feel responsive, just on a larger screen, which you know, it's actually pretty fantastic. Using my Shadowcast, I mainly played the games on my 16-inch MacBook Pro through OBS, and those inky blacks of the mini LED display do wonders for improving the overall aesthetic of the menus and contrast within games. Now, I mentioned that it's mostly the same experience. For transparency, I did experience one small frame drop while playing Super Mario World, but I can't determine if that was due to the capture card, the dock, or the handheld, and it hasn't happened again in my hours playing through various games. One other hiccup has been related to Rumble. If you play a game through a Rumble-enabled flashcard or with a DS Rumble cart inserted, Rumble will still work, but it won't transfer to the controller. Instead, as you're playing, the cart itself will vibrate, and having the console vibrate in the dock doesn't feel the greatest for its overall lifespan. 
There's always the possibility that an open FPGA core or GB Studio game will be released to communicate Rumble to the controllers connected to the dock. But to be honest, I'm betting only a subset of analog pocket owners, already a small group, will actually buy the stock. As such, accounting for external controllers might be a low priority for the platform's volunteer developers. So far, there are a lot of positives to go along with the dock. Unfortunately, those positives are almost overshadowed, for me at least, by the negative implications provided by the dock's existence. By itself, the analog pocket cannot provide a display out signal through its USB-C port. Furthermore, it has no Bluetooth radio to connect to other controllers. Both omissions feel kind of odd to me, but I also don't know if there's some sort of pricing or engineering limitation that Analog was working with while finalizing the pocket. Overall, it doesn't really matter if you only consider the Analog Pocket as a really solid handheld, but it does strip some extra functionality from the device when wanting to view it as more of like a hybrid console. Unless, of course, you buy Analog's $100 dock. Unfortunately, that's where the dock gets kind of hard to recommend. Like, yeah, sure, if you already own a Pocket, the dock itself is a nice, albeit expensive, accessory if money isn't an issue and you really want one device to do it all. Otherwise, the docked pocket faces quite a bit of a competition. During testing, I flipped back and forth between the dock via OBS and emulation via OpenEMU on my MacBook. And I didn't really notice too much difference, to be honest. Like, here's both side by side. Which one's running on the pocket and which one's running on the MacBook? For a handheld emulator, the Pocket is great, but as a desktop emulator, it doesn't really do anything that laptops or small form factor computers like a Raspberry Pi can't do when it comes to reading ROMs off of a micro SD card. Even when considering playing Game Boy carts, you can get a tool like the Epilog GB Operator for half the price of the dock to play those games, with the added benefit of also being able to back up the games and you know, rip the ROMs from the cartridges. Really, the only truly unique things I'm seeing to differentiate the dock are the native compatibility with 8 2.4G controllers, which is actually pretty nice, and the ability to play non-Game Boy physical games through an adapter. If I want to play something like, you know, a Game Gear cartridge on a larger modern display, the Analog Pocket might honestly be the easiest method using their adapter. From my limited research, other options are basically either tracking down a different analog console and an adapter, or applying hardware mods to a working OG Game Gear. So that's definitely one point in the dock's favor for sheer versatility. And the same goes for other adaptable systems, like the Neo Geo Pocket, PC Engine, Atari Lynx, and even, you know, Master System through Game Gear support. Granted, you can get your hands on some of these adapters. This might actually be the best method for playing some of those niche consoles, physical media on a modern display with very little fuss. Heck, if Analog or some random developer could create more adapters for other more popular systems cartridges, say Genesis, NES, SNES, a dot pocket would pretty much be the ultimate hardware emulation machine for retro cartridges. Unfortunately, we're seemingly a bit far off from something like that happening, so it really comes down to this dock not really adding a ton of value over other HDMI-equipped devices, unless you need one of those really niche use cases or really want your pocket to do everything. That's not to say I necessarily dislike the dock, though. As I said before, the build feels great. The heft is satisfying, and the dock itself kind of gets out of its own way during use. Firmware updates even happen automatically after connecting an updated analog pocket. As a lover of gadgets, there's plenty to enjoy, especially since the performance of the pocket remains very good. I'm just not entirely convinced that this is the most cost-effective way for folks to play their retro games while sitting at a desk. Those are my thoughts, though. What are yours? 
Are you considering picking up the dock to go along with your analog pocket? Would you personally recommend a different device for anyone looking to play retro games on a larger screen? Let me know down in the comments. And as always, if you found this video interesting or informative, go ahead and click that like button, and then be sure to get subscribed to not miss out on future tech videos. We'll, of course, also have links to all the products mentioned in this video down in the description in case you want to check any of them out. Coming up in our video lineup are a couple of videos about Windows on ARM, which, you know, is kind of exciting for me. With all the negative press the ARM-based Windows machines have gotten, I'm actually really surprised at our own experiences with it and how kind of positive it's been. But you'll have to come back later for that. That's all for this video. Until next time, catch you later.